Awesome. How many people use RSpec? Yeah. Me too. Um, so I'm going to talk about kind of my experiences testing uh, a JSON API using RSpec. Um, and how we kind of face some challenges with refactoring. This is by no means um, very complicated code, um, but it, I would say it took us a while to kind of figure out a strategy to deal with it. Um, so if there's other uh, solutions out there, um, please, please share them. Um, yeah, because I'd, I'd love to hear how other people have solved this problem. And maybe it's not a realistic problem. Um, maybe it's just my terrible code, I'm not sure. So we'll see in a second. Um, so I'm Blake, Blake Chambers. Um, I work at inside.com. Um, and uh, we have a slew of JSON APIs. If you don't know, uh, how many people have heard of Inside? Nobody, Patrick. We are a news startup. Um, we have mobile apps on iOS and Android, and we also have a website, inside.com. Um, and it's basically summaries of news. Um, with any mobile apps, if anybody is fortunate or um, uh, you are you are blessed with uh, the the pleasure of working with uh, app teams and the, the development problems that come with uh, dealing with apps, we have to support APIs for longer versions because some Android user won't upgrade their phone or they won't upgrade their version from you know the 1.0 to the 2.0. You will feel my pain. Um, so we have a lot of APIs that we use for serving all of our um, data. Um, and, and so uh, and testing APIs is a little tricky in Rails, um, especially with RSpec. Um, and kind of part of that is out of the box, there isn't a great um, strategy that's kind of prescribed for testing APIs. There's a lot of competitors, and there's some ways where I mean, m maybe most people just kind of go through a religious experience where they they figure out their version of it and then they kind of bake that into the rest of their application or they decide, you know what, it's test, screw it, we don't really care how it looks. So um, I'm going to talk about the current testing problems that we have, uh, cleaning it up and what we kind of get on the other side and then kind of a gem that I wrote that details all of the different patterns that we're using now. Okay, so this is the current version of what's called request test in RSpec Rails. Um, this is straight from the docs. Um, which you'll notice, uh, if you're familiar with like the different types of tests, what this is is an integration test, meaning you step through multiple types of sequences and the whole sequence is what you're actually testing. I'm hitting a specific page, I'm doing things on that page, I'm posting a form to that, and then I'm doing other things. and. You, trig, you know, you're following redirects and things like that, which this could be used to test a JSON API, but for the most part, you're not doing that on JSON. You're just kind of requesting almost as if you were requesting um, at the data layer, like the same way that you would be testing the way a model works. So a unit test is actually a better pattern for a JSON API. Um, so um, the takeaways that we have, uh, Black box testing is better, so something that's more like a, a model, something that runs a single request. If you're not, t if you're testing multiple requests on JSON um, using like an integration style test, you should probably do something different. Um, and you want to have something that you can create macros from, and we'll talk about macros in just a second, um, because JSON has lots of kind of shared tests that you're going to check. Um, so with all that time, uh, oh, and also, let me see, yeah, okay. So this is what we kind of came up with, and this is what a large portion of our API testing code um, is at Inside. Um, it has tons of separate if statements that all, it statements that all, um, and this is kind of con compacted um, and brought out from several different files. So what we'll do is we'll have an API and it'll test for an endpoint, but then it'll have like a concern that can mix in behavior to test for, you know, is it valid JSON? So like it tests for this content type to contain application JSON and the content type to include that it's a UTF-8 feed. 
that it has a content link tether, um, or maybe you don't because you need you want to do like chunk streaming from your API. That you provide timestamps in your objects, so all of those things can be broken out into what I'm going to call like a macro. Um, this is the only kind of system that worked for us because if you have a large it statement that tests all of that stuff in line, you end up with really complicated macro, like a DSL that you're running at the end of every it statement to perform your assertions. So this, uh, this has kind of reached its breaking point, so we decided to do something a little different. Um, so now, uh, like I said, you can macro this, but the downside is that's 11 tests worth of stuff, whereas you could probably do that in one test. Um, in a you know, regular uh, it statement in our spec. So the downside is it's much slower. Um, and by the way, this is kind of like what we, we think a macro looks like. It's usually act as support concern um, or like an include, and we include a, a little API, and it actually adds other it statements into the test suite and tests things based on the environments, like the let values that you have inside your spec. So this is cool, but it slows down the tests a lot, and you get a lot of superfluous tests that you don't you don't really need. Um, you could do it this way, where you create a macro macro off of your expect statements, but then you end up with all these like after conditions that you have to call every time you're running your tests. So, um, uh, so yeah, the macros uh, kind of have their downsides. The other thing is your macros aren't really inheritable. So you define a context at the top, but every time you have to define an it statement later, you need to redefine all of these different macros. So you say, all right, now this, this is an error condition. Um, so, but I still have to be a JSON request and I still have to return like a valid JSON body. But instead of having the, you know, the actual data, I'm gonna have an error key. So complicated. So this is, um, this is kind of the goal, something where we can do some inheritance um, and not have to have such a slow system. So this is the repo that I made. This is literally two days old, so I hate the name already and I will probably change it. Um, so it takes, um, it creates an inheritable kind of accessor that you apply your macros to and they're treated more like lets, if you're familiar with lets in our spec. The idea being that as you define context, your lets get kind of inherited as you go down the chain. So we're going to do the same thing with the expectations that we're defining. Um, we can also do the same thing with our actual variables. So here's um, an example of some code that I wrote using this gem. Um, and I'll kind of walk you through it. So up at the top, there's the include for that. Um, this uses rack test, by the way. It doesn't use our spec rails. So, um, and you can ask me about that later if you're interested in what this does. And you notice it has these like it expects blocks and it talks, it has like a little key um, for the status, the encoding, the content type and the length. What that's doing is it's defining a hash of blocks and each of those blocks is executed in an after filter anytime a test runs anywhere in the entire file. So later um, in this context block with error, you only, you would, say, now my test, instead of being a 200, it's going to be a 406 because I have an invalid, um, it's an invalid request. I'm asking for text HTML and my API only responds to JSON. So um, you only change the it expects block and all the other lines will run. The, code, the encoding will still be checked, the content type would still be checked, and the content link header presence would still be checked. Um, and you don't even have to execute the with request line. Um, that actually is also handled for you as well. Um, so you just change the stuff that you need to change. So it actually is a lot more mutatable as you create your, um, your different context. Uh, actually, I'm gonna skip, uh, I'm gonna go down. So um, the, uh, the it expect things, um, not only is it available for just the class level, like a let, but it's also available at an instance level. So you see inside of the it statement down below here, I'm actually calling it expects as well, and that overrides in the same way. So if I need to do something where I'm defining other kinds of things that I couldn't do inside of a let or before or after filter, then I can use the exact same DSL inside of the 
the, um, the actual example as opposed to being at the class level, and it works the exact same. Um, so it's really, it really simplifies things a lot. And uh, like I said, the, the thing that's more important to me is the ability to create something that's kind of an extensible macro for RSpec. Um, so this is the macro that I define, and it just has these it expect blocks, um, and they're defined you know, at the instance level or the class level. It doesn't really matter. And this is the refactored code with that macro defined. So I can now kind of transport these things around and package them up in whatever way I want. And then whenever I define a context, then I can override it however I, however I need to. It's, a, it's more flexible, basically. So um, this is the API provides. Um, at the context level, it has that it expects class. It also allows you to do inheritable request params. So you can overwrite params, ims, paths, and methods. Um, and then you can perform an actual request. Uh, and then the instance level version of that is a perform request method, but then all the other methods are still available. So regardless of where you are in your specs, you can kind of mutate your context um, without having to do a lot of song and dance. So that's the library. Um, and uh, I did, I did want to show you just really quickly. Um, the, um, this is the ac actually all the code. I don't know where the rest of it went. It seems to be, it, oh, it got like truncated or something. Um, this is actually all the code for that it expects stuff. It's, what, what is that, like 20 lines of code or something like that? It's uh, really, really simple. So if you like the pattern, check out the library and, um, or give me some feedback. And uh, yeah, there you go. That's it. Any questions? Talk about rack test. Is that just because it's faster? And okay, so um, rack test. Um, the reason we're doing rack test over um, we we use rack test just because it's a little bit lighter weight than the way that um, our spec rails works. Like our spec rails is kind of set up for that integration style setup, but for us. All we are, like, we're not doing any integration tests um, in an actual Rails app. Um, we're doing our integration, like our request tests are all in these JSON APIs. We use spinach, which is kind of like Cucumber for any of that like behavioral integration level test. So and like you test models and stuff, do you, do you test models? We do test models, yeah, yeah. We use tons that, of regular RSpec, but okay, like so we also test th the- Just this layer is at the rack yes, test level? Yes, yes, and it's at that rack test level. Um, so, and it's just, it's a little faster and it's a little easier to patch in. Rack test is like, I think 80 lines of code, so it's really easy to understand. Anything that I can read and digest in one sitting, I love putting it in the code base because it's easy for everybody to pick up quickly, you know? So, um, rack test, there you go. It uses rack test by default. So if you download the library, you'll be using rack test, whether you know it or not. Did you look at like uh, JSONAPI.org and all these lots and lots of tools online for helping API stuff? It, it's, JSON I mean, API is actually the API that we're trying to match. So this library is going to be used to build a API that's compliant with JSON API internally. Um, the testing, like, but, but I think if you're building a JSON API, you still have the pains of figuring out how to actually test things like the inclusions and the different types of URLs that can be presented from JSON API. There isn't like a baked real spec that can just do all this stuff out of the box. Um, there are testing kits like from, I think there's one from Yaks, which is like the hypermedia testing suite or you know, like the ability to do that. And then you can probably use their testing system. Um, but there's not like a definitive thing uh, for, for doing RSpec JSON API testing. So that's why we're writing something that we can use. So. I'm going to keep talking. Any other questions? Not Lauren. No, go ahead. Um, splitting up to just a JavaScript, so I, you know, playing about Angular for two sure. meetups in a row, but uh, splitting it up to JavaScript front end and Rails back end. It's just so much more complex. Like, it's, I'm just dying from it, you know? It's like, so are you testing on the front end as well from JavaScript? And then, like, 
the, the strikes in the middle is also an app unto itself. Like what actually gets passed over? You mock it all out, and you don't, that's not reality anymore. Like I just want to generate the the API to both sides. Like say, make Ruby that emits this, and make JavaScript that receives this, and I've got this in the middle layer. That's some API DSL that does docs and ensures all. I, I mean, crazy talk. I don't have time for that. But like, I mean, I don't know. We Thoughts? so. The direction we're going, and this is actually something I'm hoping to have for a talk in probably two months' time. The direction we're going is it'll be like a kind of inherited resources system, but backed by Mongo. Um, so have you used inherited resources? I'm familiar, but not lately. We're, we're like in the weeds at this point. But um, it's, it's a, like a one-liner for a Rails controller with like all the crud. Yep. Um, and if you follow the conventions, like if you know the conventions and you follow the conventions, then you end up with a, an API that's compliant. And the great thing with that is if you can do that across your 30 different resources, then your client code can share all of that same pattern. So we have that, like that, that's coming, like a, like a basically a REST kit um, that'll work with our database. We already, I mean, we already have one, but it's broken, so. Um, so then, like the controller code will be really, really simple to write, and you should be able to spin up a whole new service or router quickly, and then the mirrored code on the front end for doing that stuff. So, and we're, we're using Marionette backbone kind of stuff. So we just have a class that inherits all of that kind of behavior of like, how do we do inclusions? How do we do different types of filters? You know, how do we do persistence? That kind of stuff. You feel good about it? It's like you're getting confidence? Like you feel like you're in a good direction? And we're going in an excellent direction. Great. Like it's, such a winning pattern. We actually rewrote an act, like the app from Angular back into Backbone because Angular was kind of out of control, to be honest. So please be honest. I'm very honest. <laughs> it was out of control. So the event callback stuff was um, uh, like it, it was at the point where like the the re-rendering thing. Like Angular is great for to-do apps, in my opinion. It's perfect for that. But like we had. 30 or 40 different types of collections that we could pull um, in various different parts of the application. So it just ended up being way too many events. Backbone has a little bit more, um, I, I'll be verbose control over that, but the control makes for a better kind of application. You can manage it a little bit better, so. I, I have the same problem with the, like, where's the testing boundaries? <laughs> Where are the testing boundaries? Yeah, for, We'd, so. You, so what I ended up doing was I have like the Rails app API. This just, I have like request specs on that edge, and then on the uh, on the Ember app, I just have a bunch of mock requests that I have subbed out for those tests. Mm -hmm. But then I have a third set that does integration tests across both. So I have the server running and the Ember app compiled, and then I'll do just like almost like Capybara JavaScript style tests with Poltergeist or Phantom JS or whatever. Is that yeah. part of your Rails app, or do you do that separately, kind of like an outside Selenium kind of test? It, it's kind of outside, but I, I have it weird, set up weird. So like, I only have one repo with the client code in one directory and the server code in another directory. And then this is like a third directory with tests in it for like that knows how to spin it both and run it. So you could, I think you could do the same thing if you had two repos and the third repo that knew how to like boot up the app and run tests on it. So yeah, we do we do stubbed out JSON for our front end testing. So and it works fine. Like. How much, how much, I mean, your, like your front-end code changes a bunch and you roll out new APIs, but a lot of times your client code is baked to whatever version of the API that it's on, and then you're gonna write, rewrite your client code. So it seems to work. You just get, you get your version of the JSON and you bake it into the file and that's your, that's, your th that's the strategy in my opinion. So. Anything else? Thank you. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. Learn more today at rietta.com.